Welcome to Houston. We don't, hopefully we don't have a problem. Over the next three videos, we will cover topic number eight. This is about getting up into space, changing the orbits you're in, and then getting back down again. This is a logical follow-on from topic number six, our orbital mechanics topic. So if you stay tuned for just a second, we'll start with video one of topic number seven, covering launch vehicles. Again, we start with our cartoon. It's time we face reality, my friends. We are not exactly rocket scientists. And yes, while the end of this lecture and the end of this unit, you won't be exactly rocket scientists either, either, you'll have a better appreciation for some of the key aspects of rocket science, and specifically launch vehicles, satellites, and the like. When we couple that with the units in set year two, year three, and our fourth year, if you stay for the MN or do an MSC here, then you might be closer to being a real rocket scientist. So our questions for today. Over the next three videos, I want you to think about these questions. First, how do rockets work? What's the basic principle? Not just in how does a rocket engine work, which we'll talk more about next uh, topic in propulsion, but also how do we physically put them together? How do we calculate the performance of a rocket? The simple way. How do we stage and why do we stage rockets? What does that mean? How do we get from one orbit to the next orbit? So we talked about having circular orbits and elliptical orbits and the like, and then opening them up into escape orbits. How do we do that practically? How do we get the energy back out? I.e., how do we get back down to Earth or Mars or the moon or whatever? And which takes more energy, going to the moon or going to Mars? And it may surprise you. So stay tuned for those three videos. So let's talk about launch vehicles. Again, the purpose of the launch vehicle is to get up out of our gravity well. It's not an easy task. There's a lot of gravity to overcome. Earth is not particularly high gravity, deep gravity well, but it's still pretty darn deep compared to other places. We have aerodynamic drag and we want to minimize that. And we have to get that huge change in velocity. So what are our options that are available to us? Well, the first option is a trebuchet. It really doesn't work, but it's kind of the absurd. What about a cannon? or a balloon, or a rocket. Now, obviously the trebuchet is not considered, but the last three are all things that we normally do and we think about. And then of course, there's the elevator. Okay, trebuchets and cannons. We'll take a short pause for this and we'll resume it. So on with trebuchets and cannons. The challenge here with a cannon, more so than a trebuchet, is that we have to put the final energy state in to the beginning. So whatever the energy of our orbit, the real energy of our orbit, the combined kinetic and potential energy, has to be created as kinetic energy at the start. As a consequence, we have very, very high kinetic energy. We have to have an extremely high velocity, so all of the delts to be at the start. And if you're launching from Earth or in an atmosphere of any import or size, you'll have to have huge drag and heat loads. So in practicality, with that and the accelerations that are necessary, cannons are basically obscene on Earth. We talk about it. Um, we've tried it. People have built cannons. If you've heard about Gerard Bull, he tried building a cannon to launch satellites into orbit. Where they may come into their own, there's places like asteroid mining or off the moon where we don't have the atmospheric problem. We're launching slugs of iron or high value metals and we can do it with a cannon or a trebuchet. Because of that, we wanna use something a little bit slower to accelerate where we put the last bit, the most of the velocity in at the end, not at the beginning. And that's a rocket or a balloon. So a balloon, we can raise up to a higher altitude, minimizes our drag losses because we do it very slowly. You combine it with a rocket, what's called a raccoon, to get into orbit. And there at the bottom of this slide is an example of a raccoon. We take a water balloon up or a large balloon up to about 20 kilometers above most of the atmosphere, and then we ignite the, the rocket. We don't have to build a fared rocket or anything aerodynamic to get there. We just need the propulsion system and the payload. 
and then we provide the extra delta V. It eliminates the drag losses, but we still have to provide all the gravity and delta V input into it. So it doesn't save us that much energy. It saves us a little bit, but it's worth considering. This isn't that much different from, say, dropping off an aircraft like Virgin Galactic or dropping off or, uh, um, the Pegasus rocket or similar, but it helps us with that. And then we have our standard rockets. You can take a guess of what the rocket on the left is versus the rocket on the right. Obviously, this is the Ariane 5, and this is a rocket that does not yet and may never yet exist, the Space Launch System, SLS, which would be the largest rocket ever built and ever launched from Earth. How we estimate the performance of the rocket. We use the rocket equation, and it's a relatively simple equation. We translate velocity at the exit of our thing or ISP and mass into a delta V. And it's a very simple equation. Our starting mass over our final mass, when we burn out, the natural log of that times the characteristic exit velocity from a rocket system equals our delta V. And we can calculate or estimate characteristic velocity times G naught, that's our 9.81, that G that we use in our <clears throat> for our standard atmosphere times the ISP or the specific impulse of our rocket. We'll talk more about what specific impulse means in the next topic. But for this, it's very simple, very straightforward. One of the key things to remember is we neglect both drag and gravity losses. So the real delta V that you would actually get out of rockets gonna be sub potentially substantially less. But on our first order, it's a good way to estimate how big a rocket needs to be. Now, if we need many kilometers a second, of delta V, we're gonna have issues with the mass. Remember, rockets are mostly fuel, and but we need things for payload and guidance systems and structures. So if we wanna increase the amount of, amount of delta V we get for a given amount of mass, we do something called staging. And if you look at the delta V in the rocket equation, you'll see it is that ratio. So the more mass we lug around, the worse your delta V is gonna be for a given fuel mass. So the simplest solution is to get rid of mass as you go. In the ideal sense, we would burn the rocket up as part of our fuel. And that's not that much different from some solid rocket designs that do consume a fair amount of their structure as they go. But the easier way and more practical way is to literally throw mass overboard to do what we call stage. And when we stage, it's just a simple thing of calculating the delta V of each stage, where the stage above it is part of the payload for that lower stage. So our total delta V is just the sum of the delta Vs. And we can do our delta, our M1 and our M0 as this. And it's pretty straightforward and easy to do. So it's just to sum up when we stage. And there's many different ways to stage. And there's always trades with staging, because each stage you add has a fixed amount of mass to do the staging. It doesn't come for free. Otherwise, we would have 50, 60, 100 stage rockets. And we typically have two or three stage rockets at most. So let's talk about different stages. Anybody know what this rocket was, what we used it for? It's the Redstone rocket. As you can see from here, it has a Mercury capsule on it. So this was the Americans, the US's first space launch vehicle for human beings. It only did suborbital flights. So it was only the first two manned Mercury flights and the flights prior, prior to it. But it's a simple single stage rocket. It's really developed out of the V2 program. We had alcohol and instead of red fuming nitric acid, we had liquid oxygen. And then we had all of the um, accoutrements and, and guidance systems and the like, and then we had our, our capsule on top. But it didn't have the energy, the delta V, to get the Mercury into orbit. To do that, we needed a bigger rocket with more capability. So we did something else. If you were the Russians, you did what's called the one plus zero stage. You add strapped on boosters. And the reason they did this is they didn't think that they could ignite the core stage or a second stage in vacuum or at altitude. So you ignited all of your stages on the ground, you put more fuel in the core, or you just ran at a lower throttle. You had some zero stage strap on boosters that took you up part of the way. They exhausted their fuel and were ejected. Obviously, it's a very common design. We see that where we're trying to eke a little bit more performance out of an existing launch vehicle with maybe solid strap-ons. Obviously, the most famous one plus zero stage rocket to most people is Space Shuttle. You had the one stage, which was the main orbiter with its external fuel tank, and then you had the solid rocket boosters on the side, the SRVs for the zero stage. And that's our Space Shuttle. Um, 
in the interesting thing about the space shuttle is it produces, and I'm going to use the U.S. customary system, about seven and a half million pounds of thrust to take off at launch. Of that, just over six is the two solid rocket motors, and the three SSMEs, space shuttle main engines, produce about 1.3 to 1.4 million pounds of thrust. Now, keep in mind, you multiply that by a factor of about 4.5, and you get the number of newtons. But the interesting thing is these two solid rocket motors are basically designed to get you above most of the atmosphere and get you part way out of the gravity well. Almost all of the delta V, over 80% of the delta V comes from just these three SSMEs. So you're using those boosters really as, in the first stage, really as the way to get above the atmosphere. It's a huge amount of thrust, a huge amount of fuel just for that initial bit, but most of the velocity comes from our later stages. Another option that you can use is the 1.5 stage. And this is an option, if you talk to scientists or, or engineers, they say this is the stupidest idea ever. And a 1.5 stage rocket is you keep the rocket, you keep the body, you just throw the engines overboard. And this was used by the Atlas ICBM and ultimately the Mercury Atlas program. And the reason why they just threw the engines overboard is it had a very, very light structure. This is a fully monocoque pressure stabilized rocket and as such, there wasn't much weight in the structure and there wasn't a way to stage it. So you just drop these two outboard engines. They're all the three engines are the same basic engine, except for the nozzle on the center engines designed for vacuum or higher altitude flight. And these are designed for lower altitude near sea level. So these operate very efficiently near the ground, and this operates very efficiently at higher altitude. We'll take a hit on the performance of this engine at the beginning, and we get up above the atmosphere. And then once we don't need those engines anymore to overcome the drag and the weight as it comes down, we just jettison those two side pods and their engines. It was really just here as a B. Um, it's the only rocket that's ever done it. If you go to Huntsville, Alabama or Cape Kennedy Space Center, you will find these rockets, an example of these rockets lying on their side. And you'll hear a constant hissing because it's that pressure stabilization. The walls were infinite, you know, tinily thin, maybe a millimeter or two thick, but because they were pressure stabilized, like a soda can, a Coke can, they could take huge amounts of weight and, and force and thrust. Um, the interesting thing, when they launched John Glenn on the Mercury Atlas, it was the first Mercury Atlas launch with a human being. The U.S. Air Force hadn't even accepted the Atlas as an in-service ICBM because over half of them were failing catastrophically on a launch. But we stuck a human being on it. It worked out well, and that is history. Um, we can do more stages, two stages. Here's an Atlas V. Um, we have a main large fuel tank, in this case, uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen, and then a much smaller upper stage liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Again, this gets us out of our lower atmosphere, gets a fair amount of speed, but most of the delta V comes from this higher stage. And that's pretty common. The delta IV, the Falcon 9, they're all this type of thing, basic two-stage rocket. We can do more stages, Saturn V, where we had three stages. We can combine those, three plus zero, two plus zero, and the like as we go. So that brings us to the end of launch vehicles and video number one. In video two, we're gonna talk about orbit changes and what we call transfer orbits, followed in video three by slowing down and entry. So I'm glad you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you now soon on our next video.